Hey there, I'm Jess, and it's so great to be with you for a few moments here today. I want to welcome you to our online version of Kingston Standard Church. If you are watching with us for the first time, or if you're returning to our channel, we have lots of different resources that are available to families, both on Facebook and on YouTube. All you have to do is just search up Kingston Standard Church Cabin Kids, and our Facebook page and YouTube channels will pop up so that you are able to access those other interactive resources. So head on over and check those out. Part of our mission as a church is to equip parents for the conversations that they will have with their families as they grow and follow Jesus together. And one of the ways in which we seek to do that is through connecting the themes of scripture to our family videos. I would love to personally invite you to connect with us online or in person if you are in the Kingston area. We would love to see you. But in the description box below here, uh, you're gonna see a link that will take you to our website. Feel free to head over and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Cabin Kids, um, and follow us on Facebook as well. And on all those platforms, you're gonna be notified of all the new content when it's posted. If you wanna reach out uh, to us with any prayer requests or questions you might have, send us an email or a message on Facebook, or you're welcome to use the address below here. Your boss gave you expensive tickets to the front row of a hit play, and you forget to mark the date on your calendar, and you end up missing the performance. The day after you were supposed to be there, the boss asks, so, how was the play? And what do you say? You buy an outfit for a special occasion, you wear it that once, and then you realize you really don't need this anymore. So do you return it and ask for a refund as if it was unworn? Or a difficult employee applies for a position in another department, and honestly, like that's, that's a great relief to you. So what do you say on the reference form so that they don't bounce back into your department? Maybe the product isn't the best fit for their needs, but your sales haven't been really stellar this period at all. Is it okay because it's really not that bad? You know, life is kind of full of moral and ethical dilemmas, just like this one and many more. And we've all had to deal with situations and make difficult decisions that are testing us. Inside and at our heart, we all want to do what's right. And so how do we do what's right wherever we are? I think that question is what draws us to the account of Daniel that we're really looking into today. I think when we think about it, it's really amazing how we're drawn to really admire those people who live a life of integrity that looks a lot like the character of God. As we continue to explore integrity this month, we, we realize, of course, that our choices have consequences. They affect our daily lives, our character, our careers, our self-image, and even our relationship with God. And so we're continuing to have a look at how in times and places character matters. And the tests that come our way, we're going to see today how they kind of have a little something in common that will help us and maybe even give us some clues along the journey. And we're also going to see how the path of integrity really is a path of trust. So here's where it all kind of gets started. Daniel and his friends, their lives have taken a very unexpected turn in a heartbeat. They've lost their culture and they've lost their family and they've lost their friends. And they are now in a new country. They're going to have to learn to speak a new language. They're maybe even going to die in this foreign land as a slave to a tyrant. It would be an understatement to say life has not turned out the way they expected. This is not the way they planned things to happen. These are new situations that they're going to have to work through. And here's how the account in Scripture, starting in Daniel chapter 1, reveals what's happening to us. Verse 1 starts out, During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. 
the Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. He said, select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. Make sure that they're well-versed in every branch of learning. They're gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. And then the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. And they were, trained, they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, Azariah was called Abednego. So as we said, they are now in a world where this is a brand new normal. Every experience was new. There were certain parts of it that were so fresh, I'm sure they felt even abnormal. But you know, we can identify with some of that, right? I mean, there's times when we find ourselves outside of the places of life that we're prepared for, or they're doing what we expected, or even in some new normals. It can happen when we feel like our big break has fizzled out, or when a friend has wounded us deeply. Maybe we look around and it appears that God is not answering or moving in the way that we would have prayed. Sometimes there's even different surroundings that claim that they'll hold our secrets for us, like all the places that claim what happens here stays here. It's not even a difficult or challenging time. It's, it's supposed to be a vacation. And we end up considering going places and doing things and spending money we never would when we were home. New surroundings can lead to different responses for all of us as people. And that's sometimes when we're comfortable, you know, we make better decisions. Sometimes we don't. Ultimately, we know a little bit of what's coming up in verse 8. It says, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. So he asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. So Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water, he said. At the end of the 10 days, See how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. Now in our minds, it might be easy for us to wonder why, why did this particular thing matter? I mean, how is eating food that's prepared in the king's kitchens? It's fit for a king, basically, is what you could say about it. How is that really breaking anything? Well, one part of the objection here is that the food would have been treated as a blessing from the idols of Babylon. It would have been dedicated to the idols. And so strength that you would have garnered from this food would almost be credit and loyalty to those idols. So ultimately, there's a, a statement here about loyalty to the king and to his gods, the gods of Babylon. And there's also the dynamic of the food directives that had been given in the law of Moses. And so these things together really kind of worked in a way that betrayed that there was going to be strength and loyalty in one direction versus another. And so we kind of love 
how this continues to work out because in verse 15 it continues at the end of the 10 days Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king so after that the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine prepared for the others and God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meaning of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. And whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. And Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. So, as we said, we love how this works out. It's it's a magnificent win, like a slam dunk. I mean, Daniel and his friends did not throw in the towel. They didn't get sucked into something. Their decision made a visible and healthy difference in the way that they lived. They trusted God to show them how things would work out, even though when they started, they didn't know how it was going to end up. That's where their courage really came from, to to do the right thing in a new situation. Their confidence was that God was taking care of them. So here's this group of Teenagers, they were likely 14 to 16 years old at this point, in a tense situation, living out a life of integrity in probably one of the most powerful nations of their era. Now for us and them, we do get to see just a glimpse of how the path of integrity is also a path of trust. When our kids were growing up, there were times when, on their birthdays or even at Christmas, there was kind of this hint and hunt that were part of their gift giving. And so sometimes it was a little poem or maybe just a a little word on a paper, a hint maybe that sent them looking someplace in the house. Other times it was a full-blown set of clues that led them from one place to another and another, and then finally to the prize that they were after. And it was really fun to watch them kind of work on the clues and have these eureka moments like, oh, I know what this means now. I'm headed for the bathtub, or I'm I'm going outside to the shed, or there's a closet that I know this is what this is describing. The clues created really the larger picture that took them to the prize. And if we look at a life lived in with integrity as kind of our prize today, there's this set of clues that we find here in our account. Markers that kind of point the way to this cool reality of how it's growing in our lives. Things that are saying, you know, integrity is kind of bubbling here. It's it's moving in this direction and you're having opportunities to choose in a path of integrity. Because we get into these moments of moral ambiguity and the clues that we can find in this passage really give us a path to understanding that we're in the middle of it and, and what it takes sometimes to even persevere toward the prize of integrity. And remember, the path of integrity is actually a path of trust. So as we start with the confidence, first off, that God is looking after us, Well, let me just point out that in our case, as well as in these fellows here in our story, the journey of integrity will often include tough choices. I mean, these guys made the difficult choice about where they would draw the line. There was a risk here, and we see the chief of staff who's responsible for their training and health saying, you know what, if you guys aren't up to speed, I'm going to get wiped out. And it's also implied that, you know, the four of you will probably be wiped out too. The king didn't hesitate to eliminate people in your home country. So if you don't measure up, don't don't think for a second that you'll be spared. You're going to get wiped out too. Because tough choices really, at the root of them, mean that something's at stake. It's going to cost us something 
there are potential consequences that are kind of on the ledge and we're not really sure just how they're going to play out when it comes to money or employment, sometimes when it comes to prestige or authority or influence or even relationships and so much more. But you know what? Integrity probably wouldn't matter that much if the choices were easy, would it? There are tough choices that are part of this, and, and the path of integrity is actually a path of trust in God. So living and growing in integrity will include tough choices, but it's also kind of cool to realize that it will lead with respect. Did you notice that as we were kind of reading through the account? In a world of mic drops and social media smackdowns, it's valuable to notice the approach that Daniel and his friends use. It's not about ultimatums. It's really about options. And often we may have the impression that if something or someone is kind of pressing us or, you know, feeling like we're in a position where we're going to compromise, well, they just need to get a cold smack of our reality. I mean, they need to feel the pushback of equal or greater force so that they know we won't be pushed around. But in this case, it looks a little bit more like the sailing principle, tacking, you know, where you use the wind to help you get where you need to go. Daniel's suggestion gives value to what is important to the chief of staff, to their overseer. It even creates solutions that both of them can live with. And so, you know, when you're tacking in a sailboat, you realize you can't just move straight into the wind. It's not a straight line approach for you to go from A to B if the wind is blowing directly against you. You have to zig and zag kind of across the wind and then back and across and back. And well, the wind helps you get where you need to go as you're tacking rather than trying to drive headlong into it and just be frustrated. We can really learn a lot from what Daniel shows us here and how, as we trust God's plan in our lives and lead with respect, we can also, you know, lead with options instead of just ultimatums. But another clue that we're kind of catching up with here in Daniel's journey of integrity, Daniel and his friends are being shaped by God and his word. In this and many other accounts in the book of Daniel, it reinforces how these young men kept their commitment to God, even though they lived in a world that had culturally acceptable beliefs that ran completely counter to the way God had taught them to live. And, and the tough choices they made really weren't about, you know, getting people on board with culture. It, many of the people, probably some of them that they had even grown up with, were not following the same pattern that they were following in life. And ultimately, we don't need to see this as a statement about preferences. They didn't just prefer vegetables over food that was fit for a king. It wasn't about opinions uh, of what they thought they wanted to do in order to stand out or be remembered or distinguish themselves amongst these folks. But stuff like that can creep into our thinking, right? It influences the way we operate. And sometimes our experiences and, and different moments that we've had across the years, well, they, they give us rise to being able to say, well, this is, uh, this is the right way. This is the, the only way. And sometimes we, we find ourselves in a place where we're convinced of something and we go looking for how God can affirm our opinions or affirm what we think about things rather than the other way around and looking to him to shape our perspective and the way we see things. It, it can become about us at the middle rather than about God in the center and his word shaping who we are. It's pretty easy to slide into that place of letting God affirm what we think, rather than letting God's word shape us. Another one of the clues in this journey is, is where we see these guys along the way being consistent in small things. They were willing to absorb all that the Babylonians were about to teach them, 
about life and philosophy and, and so much more. And all this instruction was sure to affirm the ways and life of Babylon and their idols. They would even accept their name change. But food, like we said, it just seemed like it was just a small thing. It was just a, a little trigger. We mentioned how it you know, was about loyalty and where their strength came from. But many times when it comes to small things, we kind of maybe shrug them off and go, well, that's so small. I mean, it's okay. It's not that big of a deal. And then we end up crossing lines that are bigger and bigger later on. And so the journey of integrity, it, it does involve a consistency even with small things that sometimes we wonder if they even really matter. But I think we can all understand that as we walk down this road, that not everybody's going to cheer for us. It's interesting that most of those who were starting out with these four guys, I mean, it says that they had gone out and sought people from amongst these captives who had been brought from Israel. There's a lot of them that were in this Babylon leadership training group. They were likely also from Israel. And this influx of Hebrew people from recent battles would have yielded a number of potential young leaders. So, you don't really see them, though, jumping in on what Daniel and his friends are really kind of talking about here. In fact, as you read the book of Daniel, what you find out is some of them, including some other government officials, I mean, they respected these guys for their integrity and character. And then some others, well, they became jealous of them and even offended by their integrity and character even going so far as to report them and try and trap them in things to make trouble for them. And the thing we see here is we really can't control the way people respond. So the path of integrity is also a path of trust that God will take care of the people that are around us as well. Because in times we step into tough choices and regardless of how respectful it is, we can't count on everybody to cheer for us every time. So as we watch these different clues and how they fit together, the journey really starts to take shape, doesn't it? I mean, we can see the prize of integrity kind of there as day-to-day -day life continues to unfold. But what it takes to courageously walk that path for us is the same as it did in our account that we read today. It's leaning into that confidence and trust that we have with God, that he is taking care of life, that he can be trusted to work things out even when we don't know all the answers, when we don't see the complete picture. Because walking that path of trust is what breathes life into our journey of integrity. And at its root, we've talked about how the path of integrity is really a path of trust in God and in his care for us. So when we come to the tough choice, or when we're trying to figure out, is this just a small thing? Maybe sometimes when God brings his perspective and we're not completely convinced yet, well, we can ask God to help us to demonstrate respect in the middle of that time. And we maybe need to realize that not everybody's going to be on the same page with us because integrity is that choice to do what's right wherever we are. Now, there's some of you who are listening today, and you probably realize that you've been wrestling with one of these kind of moments that calls you and draws you in on the journey of integrity, and you're on that path. And maybe you're discovering how the path of integrity it really is connected to being a path of trust in God. Maybe before you go to sleep today, you're going to experience some of these clues, some of the things we've mentioned here, and you're going to realize you're on the path toward the prize of integrity in a decision or in some kind of situation in your life. And so in the next few moments, I'd just like to pray for you that you will choose to trust God, even though you may not be able to see how everything works out right now. Because the path of integrity is a path of trust in God. And ultimately, at our root, all of us want to do what's right wherever we are. 
So let me pray for us. God, we just thank you for the fact that you guide us on the journey of integrity. And ultimately, this whole process of having our lives really shaped around you and walking with you builds a path of trust in our lives. And what we see as a result of that is this path of integrity and integrity growing and, and continuing to mature in our lives in a way that we look more and more like your character. And as we mentioned when we started, I mean, there are a lot of people in this life that we admire because of their integrity. And, the, and oftentimes that integrity and character looks a lot like you. And so God, we, we ask not because we want to be somebody, but because we want to walk with you and live with integrity, that, that we could be people that folks would admire because of our integrity, because of the way that you help us to walk through the tough decisions, to work through the small things, to lead with respect, to shape our lives around you and your word. And in the middle of it, we know probably not everybody's going to cheer for us. We thank you for the fact that you will, and we look to you today. I pray that in the situations we find ourselves in right now, or the ones that are coming up, that you will help us to choose to trust you. In your name I pray, and for your sake. Amen. Thanks so much for hanging out today. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channels, and follow us on Facebook, so that you'll be notified of the content there, and stay up to date with everything happening in the church. If you enjoyed today's message, it would really mean a lot to us if you would like, comment, and share the video so that others can enjoy it too. If you happen to be in the Kingston area, like I said before, come on out. We would love to see you. If you're limited to online connection though, not a problem. Just make sure you check out our website for more at-home worship. And like I mentioned before, the link to our website is in the box below here that has other helpful resources for you as well. Please know that you are loved and that we are praying for you. And we certainly appreciate your prayers too. We'll see you soon.